The Lord be with you. As you are able, I invite you to stand and let us join together in our call to worship. I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. Praise the Lord. I invite you to remain standing, or to sit, or kneel, or take up whatever posture uh, facilitates your worship. Let us pray. Holy God, truly you are faithful forever, from generation to generation. We thank you for the faithful witness of your apostles, prophets, and martyrs throughout the history of your church and throughout the world, even today. Through their witness, we see and hear your truth. We bless you for all who bless your name through their speaking, writing, art, and music. Through their work, 
we glimpse your beauty. We praise you for all who serve you without recognition of honor, offering encouragement to the lonely, the sick, and the fearful. Through their lives, we see your faithfulness and sense your comfort. Now we pray that you will use even us to reflect the glory we see in Christ. May the voices of all your saints made holy in Christ swell in joyous praise to you, the giver of all good gifts, through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. It is a joy uh, to have you with us this morning as we gather together to worship. If you are a guest, we are especially blessed to have you here, and it is our hope that this time of worship is refreshing for your spirit and draws you closer to Christ our Lord. Uh, if you're not familiar with Laverne Heights, the thing to know about us is our mission. It's what drives everything that we do. It's our way of stating the great commandment and the great commission. And as we worship together, it's our practice to say our mission together. So congregation, I invite you to join in. We are a people committed to following Jesus, growing together, and sharing God's love with neighbors near and far. As we worship this morning, we do ask that you continue to wear your mask so that we can uh, be sure to care for those who are most vulnerable in our midst, especially uh, the youngest kids who may not have yet had a chance to be vaccinated, although they're happening right now. So that is wonderful, and we're excited with them. Um, I'll forever think of the pandemic now with Asher last week going, yeah, <laughs> that was great. Friends, as we uh, prepare to continue in worship, I want to invite you to take a moment and to examine uh, the state of the heart, uh, your heart, that you bring with you this morning. Uh, what are the contours of your heart as you gather to worship today? What are the, the praises you are bringing before God, and what are the sorrows you are bringing before God? I invite you to consider those and, and to name them at this time. And I also invite you to consider uh, the needs of the world around us as we gather to worship. We do not just bring our own lives, but we bring the life of the world with us. So what are the concerns and the joys from your neighborhood, your city, our country, and the world that you bring with you this morning? Again, I invite you to name them before God. At this time, let us take a moment of silence, and then Elder Johnny Eveleth will continue to lead us in worship. Amen. In my uh, devotional reading this morning today, I was in Hebrews chapter 3. It says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And here's the part that really struck me. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I was struck by the communal nature of that we should exhort one another every day to make sure we do not persist in an evil, unbelieving heart. As we come together in our unison prayer of confession, followed by our assurance of a pardon, we are doing exactly that. By in unison, we are coming together in agreement to confess our sins so that it would be exposed, so that we'd be able to receive the grace of God and move forward in obedience and love. So join me together as we recite the unison prayer of confession. Eternal God, in every age, raised up men and women to live and die in faith. Confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name. We are silent. You call us to do what is just. We remain idle. Call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. 
And now for a moment of silent personal confession. Lord, remind us of your mercy. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way, that joined with those from ages past, who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. And now receive the assurance of pardon and know that this assurance of pardon, that persisting in refusal to receive the grace of God and to receive that pardon is a way that we persist in an unbelieving heart. So receive this assurance of pardon and know that you are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, through his love and sacrifice, you have been forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. free to remain standing as we continue in song or be seated as, as you would uh, feel about as well.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, I invite you to be seated, and at this time, I want to invite the children to come forward. All right, come on up, and Paul, I'll invite you on up. And Jen, feel free. Absolutely. These are acorns. There's a lot of acorns here, aren't there? Mm -hmm. These acorns come from a really big oak tree that is right by my house. And um, we love this oak tree, and this oak tree has a special year this year. Every few years, sometimes up to every 10 years, oak trees will all of a sudden drop a lot more acorns than they usually do. And for our oak tree, this is the year for it to do it. It's called a mast year. And what can happen during this special year? An oak tree can drop up to 20 times more acorns than it normally does. So think about this. If in a regular year, the oak tree will drop, say, 100 acorns, in this special year, it will drop 2,000 acorns. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? This is a lot here, but this is not nearly the number that are on my ground at the house. <laughs> why, do you think, why do you think an oak tree might drop so many in one year? What do you think? Uh, it needs to make way for new acorns. It needs to make way for new acorns, yeah? What else? Any other ideas, too? There's probably lots of reasons why it's doing it. What else? Is it also changing seasons? It's changing seasons. It's time for it to do it. Any other ideas why it would drop so many all of a sudden? Part of the reason is, you know, it drops these acorns so it can try to grow more oak trees, right? Because these act as seeds to grow more trees. Hopefully not all of these will grow new trees in my yard, <laughs> right? That's too many. That is too many. But you know what else happens with acorns when they lay on the ground? Squirrels eat them, right? Other animals come and eat them as well because they need them to live, right? And so during this special year, 
the oak tree will drop as many as it can to try to make new trees and also to feed animals around. That's pretty cool, isn't it? This year, the tree at my house is trying to do as much good as it can. And not only is it trying to do good for oak trees, it's trying to do good for other sorts of things as well. Now, this reminds me of something that I've read in the Bible many times before. In fact, last week, we read a Bible verse just before this one. This comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 6 for you all, verse 10, because you want to know this too, for sure. It says this, So, whenever we are able, let us do good to everybody, especially those in the household of faith. I love this verse, because what it tells us is our job is to do good to everybody, those people who are in church with us, people who are like us, but also to those outside of church and those who aren't like us. And it says, whenever you are able, do good to everybody, especially those of the household of faith. This reminds me of the oak tree on my uh, lawn because of this. The oak tree is trying to do good for other oak trees, but it's also trying to do good for other sorts of things that aren't oak trees also. It's doing as much good as it can, and this year it's trying to do 20 times more good than it normally does. In my house, you can hear all the time these acorns landing on the roof and rolling down. (laughs) And so what I think of when I hear that is, ah, here's another way in which this tree is trying to do good for everyone. We can do those sorts of things too. Whenever we are able, do good to everyone especially those of the household of faith. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for reminders of who we can be and how we ought to be. Help us, uh, whenever we are able, always to be on the lookout for ways in which we can do good to everyone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go. As the kids make their way out, parents, we do ask that um, someone sign them in on the playground, please. Thank you. This morning, uh, we're continuing to hear from each other, from members of our congregation about their experience with the scriptures, uh, the scriptures that God has used uh, in their lives to speak uh, to them, to shape them and form them. And this morning, we're going to be hearing again from three different scriptures from three different people. And, and I want to take these one at a time again. So we'll hear a scripture, and then we'll hear from someone, and, and we'll repeat that a few times Um, But before we hear this first scripture reading, will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, your word is a light to our path. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see that we might live as faithful disciples according to your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The three readings we'll be looking at, the first is from 1 Thessalonians, and then we will be looking at a reading from Romans, and after that we will be looking at the Gospel of Luke. The reading from 1 Thessalonians is taken from chapter 5, and we are looking at verse 24. I invite you to listen now to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this.
as an aside, how many of us need to be reminded of this. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And at this time, I want to invite Marlene to come forward. Not my usual slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I used to be a kindergarten teacher, so I'm getting to that verse in a roundabout way, and I bought a kindergarten book. It's called <laughs> That's Good, That's Bad by Marjorie Kyler. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to tell you a little about the story because I think it's an apt analogy for our lives. A little boy goes to the zoo with his parents and he begs them for a great big balloon and they buy it for him and he's excited and that's good. But all of a sudden a big gust of wind comes and picks him up and carries him over the trees and to a jungle and the balloon breaks and he drops into a muddy river and that's bad. But along comes a hippopotamus and he climbs on the back and the hippopotamus takes him to shore and whew, that's good. No sooner does he get dried off than a band of baboons sees him and starts to chase him and he's running and he finds a tree and he climbs up. That's good. But then he sees that the vine that he's hanging on to is the tail of a python and that's bad. And it goes on and on till the end of the story. At uh, the end of the story, uh, spoiler alert, a big bird picks him up in his beak and takes him back over the trees to his parents. And, and I think that's an analogy for what many times we go through. We have no perspective, actually, on what's good and what's bad. Sometimes at the end of our life, we might see a little bit of it, but I think many things we will not understand until we get to heaven of what was really good and what was really bad. So I have a little story to tell you. 36 years ago, November 1985, our family sold our home in Michigan and we came across country, we we're driving across country at this very time to California. Bob had taken a job with World Vision in Monrovia. I was not happy about it. That was bad. <laughs> Why was it so bad? Well. Bob had been pastor for 25 years in churches in the Midwest. And first of all, Midwesterners do, lo do not look very kindly on the coast. <laughs> but also, that was my role. I was a minister's wife. Hey, I loved it. And this is really true. Since the time I was 11 years old, I prayed that I would someday be a preacher's wife. And all of a sudden, Bob's saying, I feel a different calling. And I'm like, wow. You know, how can that be? <laughs> What's wrong here? Maybe he has a midlife crisis or something, you know? I didn't know. But I picked that verse, you know, faithful is the one who called you is also going to do it. And I said, well, God, I guess we're in for a ride here and I, I better hang on. <laughs> what were the other reasons? Well, besides losing my place as a minister's wife, Bob would be gone all the time. He would be traveling overseas. In the days before Skype and iPhones, I didn't know where he was, who he was working with. He'd come home and be gone again on the next weekend. And so our life took two totally you know, separate directions, and that was hard. Second thing, our family was back in Michigan. Our uh, daughter, her husband were living there. Our son was there. We had 10 years of people that we had come to know and love in our church there. And we're leaving that. I knew nobody out here. And that was hard. And the third thing was I had a beautiful job. I was working at University of Liggett School, which was a private school in Gross Point Woods. We had Edsel Ford's grandson there. We had all the money you needed. We had small classes. We had lots of resources. What is that to life? But coming out here, I'd have to start all over again and you know, get recertified and look for a job. And whew, that would be hard. So I was not happy. But looking at it now from this perspective, 36 years later, I have to say, was there something good about that? And I have to look at it differently and say, oh yes. First of all, I had to learn to stand on my own feet. And that was hard for me. I always had you know, Bob around and Bob took care of everything. And now he wasn't there. So that's a good thing. I had to stand on my feet. Second thing, you people became my family. 
I thank you for your friendships. And I wouldn't have had that had we had, you know, some relationship in the church where we were willing to share that, um, those people. But you became my family. And eventually, my kids did move out here. Thirdly, I got a job at Western Christian School. Now, I wasn't making any money, but I'll tell you what was nice. They said, <laughs> I'll tell you what was nice. They said to me, you can set up your kindergarten however you like it. We've not had a kindergarten before. You can get whatever curriculum you like. We don't have much money, but hey, use your creativity. I loved it. I stayed there 20 years. And so I'm saying, oh God, there were good things I didn't see at the beginning. And so we have to ask the question, well then why does God put us through hard things? Because sometimes we don't see the outcome of it. We don't know what's happening. And we, we don't understand. But you see, I didn't understand that verse because it says, at the end of it, faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. That, that's in the King James, you know, who also will do it. And I'm thinking, what was it? Who, who was doing what? Well, it's faithful is he who called you because God is going to do a work in you. And that's a different thing. It's not saying God's going to make me happy and make everything go very nicely. He's saying, I'm going to change you. I'm going to do something in you and make you like Jesus. And it's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to be difficult sometimes. And sometimes you're going to cry and say, oh, God, why did you take me out here? Oh, God, what shall I do? At times you're going to say, I don't have anybody but you. You are my rock. You are my helper. I am helpless. And that's exactly what God's trying to do because he's trying to take us from our position of, I've got it under control, things are nice, don't take away my comfort zones, to I'm helpless without you. And that's where he wants us to be. Final story has to do with Michelangelo. This is an old story, I don't know if it's true, but I like it. <laughs> Michelangelo was carving away in his studio and there was a big block of marble and somebody said, what are you making? And he said, I see an angel in there and I'm carving away until I can set him free. And I love that because I do think it's true. God is looking at us and seeing something beautiful. And he's chipping away at our pride. He's chipping away at our self-sufficiency. He's chipping away at our comfort zones because he's trying to set free that which is eternal. And someday, you and I are going to stand in front of him and he's going to look at us and he's going to say, hey, that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene. Our second reading is taken from Romans chapter 8. And we're looking at verse 28. Again, I invite you to listen now to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God for those who were called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And at this time, I want to invite Cindy to come forward. It's hard enough to do this without following Marlene Linsicum. <laughs> <laughs> Patience, please. <laughs> um, so much has crossed my mind in preparing to express what these verses have meant to me. How do you express how much verses have meant to you when they have related to your whole life? God's word is so versatile that no matter how long you read it or what state of life you're in, it can become new and alive to you. It is so with this whole section of Romans for me. My first questionings about who I was came at an early age. I lived with my grandparents uh, when I was in kindergarten and I remember asking her, Grandma, Am I adopted? Um, my family was so different than I was. Uh, my mother and siblings were not Christians. Uh, yet 
there was awareness of God in my heart and mind, and um, most likely from living with my grandparents at the time. My mother married and we moved out, and Christ was not in that home. But my sister and I were sent to Sunday school. In uh, school, um, God provided a group of friends who took me to church and youth group with them during middle school, and I started reading God's word for myself, and it was then that I came across these verses. I was a child of God. These verses gave me a confidence and a hope. Nothing would separate me from the love of God. God was conforming my life more closely to the life of the Son. Lyle and I married at a young age. Uh, he became my hero. Uh, he took me away from a home that was becoming oppressive. We had two delightful daughters, and then we were blessed with a son. I do talk about what happened to us when he became ill quite often. I realized that. But how does one not talk about a time when God taught me so many things about himself? David was, I'm sorry. You're okay. <laughs> David was hospitalized for 11 days. And when he came home, the first Sunday was Palm Sunday. Romans 8.32, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, became so much more meaningful to me, as I felt the pain God must have felt when he did not spare his own son, but gave ours back to us after that long, frightening illness. We felt Christ interceding for us time after time when we had no words how alive his word became. Have there been troubles and hardships through the years? Yes, but we are more than conquerors. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, a love that overwhelms me with its depth. Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Our third reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. Again, I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So we got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. 
Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached his house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, Your brother has arrived, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because his, he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I've served you all these years, and I never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned and gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This time I invite Scott to come forward. Good morning. The parable of the prodigal son, or the lost son as many often know it by, has long been one of my favorite passages in the Bible. That might seem a bit odd to some of you who know me well, since I'm generally not the type of person to waste all my money in wild living like the lost son. That, that would be a real occupational hazard as a financial advisor. <laughs> Nor, nor do I think I'm particularly prone to jealousy or righteous indignation exhibited by the older brother, at least I hope, hope I'm not. Um, so what is it about this parable that speaks to me uh, so deeply? For me, this is ultimately a story about God's love, his abundant and overflowing love for you and me as sinners willing to repent and turn our hearts towards God. It's a forgiving love that seeks to redeem us and continually bring us back into right relationship with God. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, my church upbringing didn't always promulgate uh, this loving view of God. Purity culture, what would Jesus do bracelets, and accountability partners tended to create for me an image of God who was just waiting for me to step out of line. God quickly became this figure I was trying to please, and if I'm honest, I was oftentimes afraid of. Which is why I have found so much peace and joy from this passage. I still get goosebumps when I read how the father ran to his son when he was a long way off, kissing and embracing him. He gave him his finest clothes. He kills the fatted calf, celebrates with a feast. This is so countercultural to everything we expect, and yet the response of the father is just pure, unadulterated love for his son, that it just catches me completely by surprise every time. I think it's important to note that this amazing scene comes to be, not by chance, but by the simple act of repentance of the prodigal son. He humbles himself and confesses that he has sinned against both heaven and his father, and he's not worthy to be called his child. This is one reason why I have long made it part of my prayer routine to confess my sins to God and ask for his forgiveness, as childlike as that may seem. Repentance is certainly more than just prayer, but for me, it's the starting point that hopefully gets me moving in the direction of repentance and helps me see that God is always bounding towards me with outstretched arms, welcoming me back into a loving and personal relationship with him. It's one of the many reasons I so value our weekly prayer of confession and love that it's part of our Presbyterian liturgy. 
Ultimately, this parable reminds me of the truth that God's love for me isn't conditional. He doesn't dole it out in a measured fashion. It's not selfish or self-serving. In fact, it's quite childlike in nature, and I might even suggest it's downright over the top and extravagant. There's nothing cautious about it. It's a love that sent his son to die a gruesome death on a cross. And even though we continually falter and sin, he's waiting to let us back in every single time. Last Sunday, as I was starting to think about what I wanted to share about this parable, Jared and the worship team performed the song, Reckless Love. It was one of those moments where the music and lyrics expressed what I was thinking and feeling far better than I could ever wish to. And so I'll finish by sharing the main chorus of the song. If I was braver, I would sing it for you, but I'm not. <laughs> the song goes, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Friends, as you listen to Marlene, to Cindy, to Scott, I invite you to consider uh, what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart this morning to note. And I invite you to take a moment uh, and to get hold of it, to don't just let it disappear as the clock ticks on, but instead to, uh, to name it so that you can carry it with you as, as we go forth later this morning. And let us pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks that you speak to us through your word. We give you thanks for the testimonies of our brothers and sisters that encourages us, that exhorts us to faithfulness by turning us again and again to you and your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be at work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. And by your grace, we pray that you would make us faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Dave, for leading us in worship. Friends, it is a joy to be able to turn our hearts and our minds and our prayers to the world and the community around us. As you hear, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray together. As the Church of Jesus Christ, let us pray for the ministry of the Church. Gracious God, you have called us to be the Church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love, turn to your ways, and live in the light of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the care of creation. Creator of all, you entrusted the earth to the human race, yet we disrupt its peace with violence and corrupt its purity with our greed. Prevent your people from ravaging creation that coming generations may inherit lands brimming with life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for reconciliation in relationships. Holy God, from whom every family on earth takes its name, strengthen parents to be responsible and loving that their children may know security and joy. Lead children to honor parents by compassion and forgiveness. May all people discover your parental care by the respect and love given them by others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for peace and justice. Holy God, strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated and the old cared for, the hungry filled and the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for healing and wholeness. Especially we pray for Judy Greeren that she accepts and welcomes her new home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Especially we pray for Denise Haas who is facing further surgery on November 15th. Prayers that the surgery would be successful and for God's comfort and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, your son gives rest to those weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. Lift up the depressed. Befriend those who grieve. Comfort the anxious. Stand with all victims of abuse and other crime. Awaken those who damage themselves and others through the use of any drug. Fill all people with your Holy Spirit that they may bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, your love is stronger than death and your passion more fierce than the grave. We rejoice in the lives of those whom you have drawn into your eternal embrace. This day especially, we remember Carl Hayes. Keep us in joyful communion with them until we join the saints of every people and nation gathered before your throne in ceaseless praise. God of glory, you see how all creation groans in labor as it awaits redemption. As we work for and await your new creation, we trust that you will answer our prayers with grace and fulfill your promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you are able, I invite you to stand or to remain seating, to kneel, whatever posture allows you to continue in worship. And parents, I invite you to uh, move to the narthex where the kids will meet you from the playground as we prepare for communion together.
Beloved of God, around this table, we are united with the saints from every time and place. As we prepare to pray around this meal that we receive together, I invite you to remain standing or to sit, uh, whatever posture is most helpful for you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. We praise you for saints and martyrs, for the faithful in every age who have followed your Son and witness to his resurrection from every race and tongue, from every people and nation, you have gathered them into your kingdom. You have shown them the path of life and filled them with the joy of your presence. How glorious is your heavenly realm where the multitude of your saints rejoice with Christ. We remember with thanksgiving our Lord's meal with his disciples in which he took the bread and blessed it, broke it open and gave it to them saying, this is my body, take and eat it, remembering me. We remember how he took a cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, drink it all of you and remember me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Friends, Jesus Christ is the true bread from heaven who came and gives his life for the life of the world. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And when we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Beloved of God, these are holy gifts for holy people. Yet who is holy? Come then, in Jesus Christ, everything is made ready. Friends, at this time, I invite you to take uh, your communion cup and to open the bread side and to take it whenever you are ready as a sign of your individual faith in Christ. And then I invite you to uh, open the cup side and to hold it, and we will take it together as a sign of our unity in Christ.
friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for the redemption of all creation. Let us pray. Number us among your saints, O God, and join us with the faithful of every age, that strengthened by their witness and supported by their fellowship, we may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and may with them receive the unfading crown of glory when we stand before your throne of grace. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ we pray, amen. At this time, I want to uh, invite Joanne to come forward. This morning is a, a special celebration. You know, one of the ways that we uh, do ministry as a congregation is through our ministry groups. And Connect Ministry Group has been a significant part of that for a very long time. Uh, and they have decided that the time has come for them to close. And so we are going to be celebrating and thanking God for them this morning. And at this time, on behalf of Session, I want to invite uh, Patricia to come forward. <laughs> we can go over here. <laughs> it is my privilege to represent Session, and I'm going to represent the church family as well. Your group evolved during a time of transition as a church. It was um, a time of need, but your group saw it as an opportunity mm -hmm. and your faithfulness, we've all been touched. Thank you. Thank you. Let's <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> And at this time, Joanne, I'll let you invite your team forward. Yeah, so my, my current team is Marlene and Ellie and Barbara and Judy. And there were lots more of you that have been part of it at different times, but that's my current team that finished up. So come on up. All right, come on up. Okay, so I have a couple questions I'll invite you to answer. You can answer or not answer. Pass the mic as you want, okay? Um, but here, here's the first question. Uh, what is one of the highlights of your service, all the many, many different things that Connect was a part of, what is one of the highlights of the ministry of Connect for you? Uh, I might say bread delivery. It was really fun to give a gift, a surprise gift. I'm kind of like Steve last week that said, you know, I would look through the attendance pad and be like, oh man, I have to go this week. <laughs> Somebody came, but then it was always such a joy to meet the new person and talk, and, and they were just so surprised and welcomed, and it was really fun. So that was a really fun ministry. Oh dear. I like dumb, dumb jobs, and, <laughs> and somebody needed to organize the coffee ministry. So for 10 years, I organized the coffee ministry and made coffee, and I was very happy to do that. That was small, but I loved it. I've just enjoyed being a part of the Connect group and participating in the different things that they have put forward for me to help with. I enjoy the camaraderie and I don't know. <laughs> I'm not good at this. <laughs> I was still fairly new to this church, but I'd come from a church where I was very involved. And so being invited to be part of Connect was just the answer to a prayer. I enjoyed being involved with Connect, all the different activities that we did. One thing that I especially enjoyed was on Communion Sunday, standing out at the door, greeting people and having them put on their name tags. So I got to know people that I didn't know before. 
It's been a privilege being with Joanne. She's been a tremendous leader to us. Thank you. Yep. And then the, the next question I want to invite you to consider is, what is one way that God has shaped your life, your life of faith, through the ministry of Connect? I would say he's really grown me in leadership. That, that wasn't what I would have said my strength was, but I, I really valued seeing God in all you guys, and all you guys. I mean, Connect was shepherding the ministry of Connect, and it only worked because so many of you participated in our ministries. You were the hands and feet of our ministry. And I guess it was really exciting to see God work through you and to shepherd the ministry and just trust in God that he will bring the ministry about. And it's not about what I do. It's not about each one person, but it was what God did through us. And that was just neat to see my faith and leadership grow um, throughout the years. Um, I learned to like to go into nursing homes and love people there. I don't think I ever paid much attention to that before, but I think that that aspect of, of caring began to be real to me, and uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, the teacher has given me strength to carry on after some things happened in life, and uh, just to move on forward and have faith. <laughs> um, it just gave me chances to see where there were needs and with the team, you know, jump in that whole thing about look for ways to do good. It gave me faith. Um, it opened me up to visit people that were in need. It's been very important. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the congregation, we are grateful um, it would take a long time to list all the things that Connect was involved in. Um, it's not too much to say that under Joanne's leadership, when Connect saw a need, they just sort of jumped in and filled it, and they were looking. And so we are tremendously grateful for all that you all have done uh, and for your many, many years of faithful service. At this time, I want to invite the elders to come up, uh, ruling elders, teaching elders, and Elder Steve Salyards um, is going to say a prayer uh, for you all. you all. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, you place a call on each and every one of our lives. You are calling us to something in various seasons, something else in other seasons. We thank you for the ministry of the Connect Ministry Group. We thank you for all who have served on the, served, served as members of the group throughout its existence. We thank you for all of those who have assisted, that they have reached out to and that have answered that call in your name to help out with ministries in this church. We thank you for the needs they have seen and filled. We thank you for the time spent being sensitive to what is going on here. We thank you for all of the service that they have provided over the years. We thank you for the opportunities and calls that they have just expressed and that the others in the group have expressed throughout the years as well. We thank you for this ministry and we thank you for, every, for there being a time, uh, a season for everything. And as they move on now to other ministries, we pray that you will be blessing them, that they may be a blessing to you and to this congregation. And again, we thank you for their time, for their service, and for all that have helped over the years. As we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Following the service, um, 
there will be a time of fellowship. There's cake out on the patio, and I encourage you to uh, grab some and then to find the members of Connect and to express your gratitude uh, to them for the ways that that ministry touched you. At this time, I want to invite uh, Jeannie to come forward, and she's going to give us update on the women's retreat that took place yesterday. Good morning. Yesterday was such a wonderful time together with the women who joined us in the retreat. We had an opportunity to study the life of Sarai Sarah and her desire to have a child and how God brought that about. And to think about our, in our own lives how God has a plan that might be different than our plan. And to then um, be still and know that I am God before him. We had a chance to um, spend time getting to know each other quite a bit better, and it was just a lot of fun and always a good time where we can walk away with something to um, think about moving forward in our lives. And I also want to thank the people who helped put it, pull it together. It does take many hands, and so especially Joanne, who's so faithful to our women's ministry and helping get this going every year, and then the many people who helped us with the setup on Friday and uh, in the kitchen and so forth. Um, if I name names, I will forget someone, but I will thank you them again now and ask you all to give them a hand. Thank you so much, Jeannie. There are a few other announcements I do want to make sure you're aware of. Next week, following worship, we will be uh, putting together the Thanksgiving baskets. And so uh, if you would like, I encourage you to consider a donation uh, to that end to help us fill the baskets. But again, following worship, we're going to have the opportunity right out on the patio for everybody to get involved and do what you can so that we can uh, fill those baskets together. And then after that, we will have a LVHPC 101 class. If you are curious and want to learn more about the congregation, or if you are considering membership, I encourage you to uh, come and check that out. You can reach out to the church office to sign up, and we would love to see you. Uh, that following Saturday on the 20th, we have the craft fair. There are over 50 vendors signed up, so I encourage you to swing by. Uh, and a big thank you to the Bridges Creative Team for putting that together. Um, and then that next day on the 21st, following worship, uh, we will have uh, some Advent wreaths that we will be making, inviting each family to make an Advent wreath. We'll have a devotional for you uh, that you can take with you at that time as we prepare for our Advent journey. And then following that, we will have the Youth Pie Auction. All right? So we have all sorts of things happening over the next couple weeks. I encourage you to uh, reach out for more information in the church office for any of those things. Uh, as you leave this morning, there are some boxes that have uh, your giving statements in them. They're white envelopes. They've got names on them. So please look through those. Be sure to take uh, your statement with you. Look it over. Um, there's a letter in there from the treasurer, Jason Price. If you uh, see anything that needs attention, please don't hesitate to reach out to him and, and let him know. So I encourage you to grab those. Uh, whatever doesn't get picked up, we're going to mail out tomorrow. So uh, please grab those on your way out. And then um, the last thing is, on behalf of Session, I'm excited to let you know that as a congregation, we are going to start singing again together on Christmas Eve. So that is right around the corner. We're looking forward to that, to being able to make a joyful noise together. So um, friends, it's been a good day to be with you, a good day to worship God with you. As you prepare now to leave this time of worship and to enter the worship that you will live throughout this week, I invite you to stand as you are able. As you go, I invite you to consider where you will be over these next days. Uh, what are the places that you know you'll be for work, maybe the meetings you know you'll have, the people you'll be uh, speaking with, caring for, uh, what are the responsibilities that lie before you, your, your responsibilities maybe in the community? Friends, in all of those places, the ordinary places of our lives, that is the place where Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so as we prepare to live out that ministry, let us pray our prayer together. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. 
Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now receive the blessing. May the triune God go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, beneath you to uphold you, within you to give you faith, hope, and love, and before you to show you the way. And let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen.